Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. The topic for today's webinar is Energy Storage 101 Part 1, Battery Storage Technology, Systems and Cost Trends. This webinar is presented by the Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership, also known as SDAP. SDAP is a collaboration of the U.S. Department of Energy, Sandia National Laboratories, and the Clean Energy States Alliance, also known as CESA. So before we get started today, I'd like to pass it, I'd like to um, go over some quick housekeeping notes. All of our attendees are in listen-only mode, so that means that you can hear us, hopefully, but we can't hear you. You have a couple of options to join the audio portion of our webinar. You can call in using a telephone, or you can connect using your computer mic and speakers. If you'd like to minimize your webinar console, you can use the orange arrow that you see circled here. You can also use that arrow to expand the webinar console. A very important note, we ask that you please submit questions and comments via the questions panel on your webinar console, um, and then you can hit send. We ask that you submit your questions and comments throughout the webinar. Don't wait until the very end. We have a lot of people registered for our webinar today, so we should have a lot of questions. To make sure that we get to yours, type it in when you think of it. Don't wait until the very end. A final note, this webinar is being recorded. We will send you an email later this afternoon, probably, or tomorrow morning, with a link to the webinar recording and a PDF of the slides. All of these materials will also be posted on CESA's website at cesa.org backslash webinars. All right, so with that, I'd like to pass it over to our host for today's webinar, Todd Alinsky-Paul. Todd is a project director at the Clean Energy States Alliance, and he'll be moderating our webinar today. Okay, thanks very much, Samantha. Uh, this is Todd Alinsky-Paul. Welcome, everybody, to the webinar. Today's uh, webinar is the first in a series. It's a new series, uh, Energy Storage 101 and it's intended to cover a variety of topics uh, related to energy storage. So if you, uh, if you like this uh, webinar, be sure to come back and, uh, and join us for the following webinars in the series. And uh, we, at the end, we will <clears throat> announce some upcoming webinars and, and uh, remind folks about uh, what the topics will be for the rest of the series. I want to do a brief intro on the uh, Clean Energy States Alliance for anyone who may not know. Uh, we are a small nonprofit uh, located in Vermont and uh, essentially it, we are a membership organization of state clean energy funds. You can see the logos of our state members on the screen. If you could advance the slides, please, Samantha. Um, we do a lot of work for state members on all kinds of clean energy topics, and among those is energy storage. Uh, so this particular webinar and the others in this series are uh, produced uh, under our Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership, or STEP, which is a program supported by U.S. Department of Energy, Office of Electricity, and Sandia National Laboratories, and it is uh, conducted under contract with Sandia. And the primary uh, activities for STEP are to um, put together jointly supported federal, state, uh, and sometimes municip municipally supported energy storage projects. And so this is energy storage deployment on a large scale. As you can see by the map, we have projects all over the country where we have uh, helped to put together these, these joint efforts. Uh, we also do a lot of knowledge sharing through these webinars and, and other methods of, uh, of information sharing, uh, conferences and uh, reports and so forth. And we also work to support state energy storage policy and program development. Um, and, and that's something that is also reflected to some degree on this map, uh, where we help to, to help state agencies put together energy storage programs, uh, including grant programs, um, you know, rebates, uh, solicitations of all sorts. Next slide, please. So I want to introduce briefly our speakers today. Uh, first up, we will hear from Dr. Imri Zhuk of US DOE, Office of Electricity. 
Uh, Dr. Zhuk directs the Energy Storage Research Program at DOE, uh, which funds a wide variety of technologies, such as advanced batteries, flywheels, supercapacitors, and compressed air energy storage. He has a PhD in theoretical physics from Purdue University. We're also going to be hearing from Dan Borneo, an electrical engineer and principal member of staff at Sandia National Laboratories. He's the principal investigator and project leader for the DOE Office of Electricity Electrical Energy Storage Demonstration Program. Uh, Dan's primary focus is collaborating with representatives of the energy storage industry, academia, and state energy groups to facilitate moving innovative electrical energy storage technologies and systems to commercialization products and services. Uh, we also are fortunate to have Dr. Vince Sprinkle of PNNL, that's Pacific Northwest National Laboratories, on board to help answer some questions. I don't believe Vince is going to be presenting, but he will be here to answer your questions at the end. Uh, Vince is the chief scientist for the Electrochemical Materials and Systems Group at PNNL. Uh, the group is focused on the development of electrochemical materials and systems for advanced energy storage and conversion applications. He's project manager for the Department of Energy Office of Electricity Energy Storage Program at PNNL and holds 14 US patents on fuel cells, batteries, and high temperature electrochemical devices with 22 pending patent applications. I'm hope, I hope I'm up to date with the, the, your patents, Vince. You can correct me if we've left, left any out. Uh, and was named PNNL Inventor of the Year in 2014. So if you have questions about the future of uh, flow batteries or latest battery chemistries, Vince is a good guy to have on board. Uh, so uh, if you advance the slide, please. Uh, I want to remind everybody that we do have an extraordinarily large number of uh, people registered for this webinar, uh, over 1,000, um, getting close to 500 already on board and more people uh, signing in every second here So during the intro. So please uh, don't hesitate. Type in your questions as you think of them. We will get to as many as we possibly can. We've, we're extending the uh, webinar to up to an hour and a half as needed to accommodate your questions so we will get to as many as we possibly can. Uh, without further ado, I will pass this over to Dan Bornea, uh, I'm sorry, to Emery Zhuk for the introductory remarks and slides. Hello, uh, I am Imre Zhuk and I direct the Energy Storage Research Program at the Office of Electricity at DUE. And I would like to offer these introductory remarks for the uh, series on energy storage, which we are about to kick off. Oops. There we are. Uh, so why are we worried about energy storage to begin with? Well, it is simply that the grid has become vastly more complex uh, than it used to be uh, as recently as say 20 years ago. We have variable or intermittent sources of energy, wind, solar, along with fossil, and the load has been becoming more complex as well. So what is needed is a buffer between the electrical generation and the electrical load. And electricity storage provides this buffer. Now, it is not the only thing that plays to even out uh, the playing field there. Uh, there are other balancing te technologies, such as demand management, thermal storage, chemical storage, uh, hydrogen, for example, uh, and building technology itself, passive solar, uh, what have you. Uh, all of these technologies uh, provide useful uh, roles, but they are not, strictly speaking, energy storage. <clears throat> so what does it take to develop a new program, well, of anything actually, and of energy storage in particular? Well, we have to consider the interplay of the different areas of markets, 
policy and technology. It's not just technology-based, policy and markets are equally important. And on top of that, the field exists in a wider uh, environment, which includes such elements as politics, economics, social movements, climate, of course, uh, disasters as they occur, and resource competition for uh, materials uh, for storage. So it's a big universe, and there are a lot of things to be considered if we want to have an energy storage technology that uh, goes into uh, all fields of, uh, of, of technology. Energy storage has been growing very rapidly. Of course, we are only here at 2018, but uh, subsequent years are already assured in projects that are ready to go online. These numbers are provided by uh, Wood McKenzie, formerly GTM, and they are the best estimate uh, which we have of future storage deployment. And incidentally, these are being updated every year, and every year the goals are higher and higher. You will also notice that residential, non-residential, and front of the meter are equally predicted to be uh, burgeoning forth. So, for the most part, those deployments in the previous slide are all about lithium-ion batteries. There are pros and cons for lithium ion. One is that the cost is relatively low and uh, they are market ready. There's also a tie in with EV development, uh, which is important because that's an area that is rapidly growing. So if we are to believe the charts, we see this exponential decline in uh, the cost of lithium ion. Incidentally, uh, could we ask uh, uh, some of you, Dan Borneo, Todd, to mute your microphones, please? Okay, going on. Uh, there are also negative things. The cycle life, for one thing, is considerably less than 20 years. Uh, there are serious safety concerns. There is little or no recycling of lithium ion. And uh, from the point of view of DOE, there is no real US manufacture. Also, we may notice that the price of components of lithium ion batteries such as cobalt is very vo volatile. Now it is true this spike here went down again, but nonetheless the volatility is there and uh, the market uh, is depending. So I am not sure this exponential decline will go on forever. I have a feeling that we will see an uptick of prices in the future. Okay, there are obstacles and impediments for a truly sustainable energy storage technology. Uh, safety and reliability are one of them. Uh, we've had 27 megawatts go up in flames in 2017, and that's in just one country. There are ecological and sociological issues. Uh, this is how cobalt is mined in Africa. Uh, not really acceptable. And reuse, recycling, and disposal is something that has to be seriously considered. So, first of all, safety is essential. Uh, we need research and statistics urgently. How much should liability insurance be 
uh, in view of all these uh, lithium fires which we have been seeing. And by the way, they are not just in uh, stationary power plants, they also occur in vehicles, they occur in uh, electronic cigarettes, uh, they occur on electronic bikes, uh, they are fairly pervasive. So, can the technology be improved? Uh, cars are have accidents too, but seat belts can improve it. Should the technology be replaced? Uh, hydrogen airships never made it. So the important thing is safety should not be a patch, but should be part of the design of any present or future energy storage technology. Reliability is also essential. After all, energy storage is introduced to make the grid more reliable. So if the devices are not as reliable as they should be, uh, that seems inappropriate. So do we go for cheap replacement or do we go for durability? And again, reliability should be part of the design. And then uh, there are the ecological and sociological issues. Uh, energy storage should be cheap for whom? Is it just for uh, first world consumers or should they be cheap for everybody around the globe? Uh, who will pay? Uh, there are costs involved in the uh, proper waste stream, for example. Somebody has to cover that. What's the total carbon footprint? I still have to see uh, the carbon footprint from the original mining of the constituent materials all the way until the trash heap. Will this help with global warming? Does it promote social equity? It should. Is the technology sustainable? That's what we need. So reuse, recycling, and disposal, a complex of uh, ideas that we have to grapple with. Uh, it's well known that electric vehicle batteries retain about 80% of their capacity uh, after they are, uh, after people are done using them. So do we want to reuse these for stationary applications? Certainly it can be done in principle. Uh, the Office of Electricity is doing a number of experiments in this. Or do they go on a trash heap? Recycling uh, is certainly technically feasible, but is it commercial, commercially feasible? Or does entropy win again? The trash heap is not really an answer. We must design for the waste stream itself. And I'm pleased to say that DOE is now offering a lithium ion battery recycling prize for the best project in this area. So we need to develop safe, inexpensive, and environmentally benign batteries. And for that, we must look towards earth abundant materials. Those are the ones in the upper left hand corner there. And lithium is indeed in that area but so are a number of other things. They should be uh, somewhere around uh, this uh, rough area. Notice also that organic substances are in there. Here are some of the technologies we are considering and their cost goals. For lithium ion batteries, uh, maybe $250 per kilowatt hour, but could go lower. Uh, this is uh, for the cells only. For flow batteries, uh, we sh uh, have shown that they can go down down to $300 per kilowatt hour. This is for vanadium, vanadium flow batteries. We are researching zinc manganese oxide, which may go as low as $50 per kilowatt hour. We are looking at low temperature sodium, sodium iodide batteries at $60 per kilowatt hour and aqueous soluble organics at $125 per kilowatt hours. Uh, these will be redox batteries, very much like the vanadium redox batteries. 
Uh, but we should remind people that advanced lead acid batteries will not be standing still either, and they have the potential of perhaps going as low as $35 per kilowatt hours. And as we know, they recycle beautifully. So uh, we will have new technology solutions, and these will cut costs, and they will increase safety and reliability. And I am hopeful that reuse, recycling, and disposal issues will indeed be resolved. But the question is, can these new technologies prevail in the marketplace? Thank you. Thank you, Emery. That was uh, really chock full of information. We have a lot of questions lined up already, but I think what we should do is uh, go ahead forward with Dan's presentation, which may answer some of these. And then uh, Dan is going to do his best to leave sufficient time to get to a good number of questions after his presentation. Uh, so Dan, I'll, I'll pass the baton to you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I have to say, for once, I'm pretty excited. We have over 500 uh, people on the call, and I'm, I'm really excited. Been in this business, been in the electrical business going on 40 years, over 40 years, been in the battery business uh, the past 12 in this energy storage for, for stationary applications. And I have to, to admit that 12 years ago, I didn't know what the future of energy storage was going to be. But uh, if this is any indication in, in all the projects that we're seeing happening and all the all the buzz about the energy storage for stationary applications, I think we hit the inflection point. Okay, so um, you know, it takes it takes a village to do anything, and and there are all the contributors to help to develop this series, this energy storage. 101. Uh, we started this this um, presentation a year ago, and we had Emery and Vince and Babu and Ray, myself, Jeremy, Todd, and Susan all pitching in. And uh, we've been taking this this webinar. We we have one hour, two hour, four hour, and now the webinar series. And we'll probably do five, maybe more, depending on the feedback that we get from from you. Um, on what topics you want us to cover. So if there are topics that you don't see coming up, um, these are the topics. Please drop us a line and let us know and we'll add these in. We're, we're gonna try to do many um, webinars on various topics over the course of the next year or so, one to two a month. So you'll see that Today, we're going to talk about technology, the energy storage systems, and cost trends, uh, which Emory pretty much covered already. And then future installments, we got applications and the economics of utilizing those applications. We're going to talk about policy and regulations, uh, safety and reliability, as, as Emory touched on, uh, that we need to really focus on. on. And then uh, the project development, the commissioning of a system to make sure that it's safe and reliable and the deployments. All right, so here we go, getting started. So um, the energy storage deployments to date, you'll see the, the big takeaway of this slide, and I'm not going to go through every line of the slide because uh, we want to save time for questions, but I, I think that the big thing is, is as Emery said, if you want an energy storage system today, it's most likely going to be lithium ion. You'll see there's sodium metal projects out there. Those are mostly the sodium sulfur batteries that you'll find in Japan. We have a couple in the United States. Uh, lead acid has been around for 150 years. It's not going anywhere. Uh, we have some flow battery installations. Um, in the U.S., we have 0.75, almost a gigawatt now of battery energy storage, and that was about half of that maybe two to three years ago. So in the last year or two, we pretty much doubled the amount of 
battery energy storage that we have installed in the U.S. Uh, pumped hydro has always been around, and that still makes up the lion's share of the energy storage that is installed in the U.S. Uh, pumped hydro is a is a great it's a great um, energy storage vehicle, if you will. But the problem is, is you need a reservoir uh, top and a reservoir bottom, and the permitting and the environmental issues have really put a hamper on uh, new pumped hydro plants uh, being built. And in the bottom right hand, you'll see the average duration discharge. And what's making the flow batteries exciting is the fact that they're long term for four hour batteries. Uh, there's been a lot of studies going on mostly with the utility in mind stating that a long duration battery is where the the industry needs to go it has a lot more flexibility for what the utilities would like to do and you'll notice that it says lithium ion at two hours but be, be it known that all you have to do is just put more batteries in in parallel and you can gain as many hours of the battery uh, of the energy that you need. So uh, even though it, typically today we're seeing two hours, it could go two, four, six, eight, uh, and it could go down also to 15 minutes. And that's what the beauty of lithium ion is. It is very flexible and can do um, many energy applications. So the, in the growth in the battery energy storage, so it's still less than 0.1% of the U.S. generation capacity. I think this number is actually outdated a little bit. I think we're a little bit higher than that now, but um, we're still not, we're still haven't made a big dent into, into the uh, distribution, but it's growing every year. So this is basically where, where you see the role of battery energy storage. And you'll notice that I'll talk mostly about battery energy storage because that's what our program is focusing on. Uh, there's also the super caps and the flywheels. Uh, flywheels are, are great, but they're short duration um, energy storage devices, less than 15 minutes. Uh, super caps are, are even less time than that though there is work being done to prolong the amount of energy they can store. You have the compressed air energy systems over in the top right hand up there with the pumped hydro system. Uh, compressed air energy storage system, um, you may or may not know, is basically they have the caverns. They pump the air into the cavern when they want to store energy and they release the air when they want to produce uh, energy. So um, the problem with that, once again, is the permitting. I know California was trying to do uh, compressed air energy storage systems, and they were were having little success in getting the permitting in place to build these caverns or utilize caverns and make them ready to store compressed air. And you'll notice the discharge. So you got the 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 power on the one hand, the battery, and and the discharge duration. Um, the I'm sorry, the power on the y-axis and the discharge discharge duration on the x-axis. And you'll see the battery energy storage can play pretty much across the whole gamut. So just some just some terminology. Uh, you'll hear people talk about the the electrochemical cell. That's a battery, you know, made up of a cathode, anode, and there's electrolyte which it conducts the, the ions, which allows the electrons to flow. Electron flow is current. Current lights your light. Um, so energy. Everything we talk about is power and energy. Energy is the ability to do work. It's 
measured in kilowatt hours. When you look at your electric bill, you pay for kilowatt hours. Uh, power is the rate at which the work is being done. Um, that's measured in kilowatts. That's kind of confusing to me. So Dan's definition is uh, the kilowatt, especially when we're talking about energy storage, is the capacity of the energy storage system, i.e. Uh, one kilowatt. So, so that's the nameplate. That's the maximum amount of power that you, you can get out of the system. For instance, if you have, a, well, I'll get to the example, a kilowatt hour is the capacity multiplied by the, the time and hours rating of the system. So um, if you have a one kilowatt, two hour system, you have a two kilowatt hour system. So as an example, if you have 10 100 watt light bulbs that need to operate for one hour, then you would need a one kilowatt system for one hour, and that would be a one kilowatt hour system. So uh, energy density is also a, a, um, a terminology that we use in the business. Energy density is used to measure how dense, how much energy you can get out of, out of a certain square footage or a certain uh, area. So um, when you look at energy density, I, I will get to a slide later on and we'll talk about the, the various energy densities and you'll see how they all stack up to one another. And basically that's just how much, how much square footage you're going to need to get a certain amount of power rating and a certain amount of energy in KW and KWH. And then obviously capital uh, the kilowatt hour cost is the capital cost of the energy content and the per kilowatt cost is the capital cost of the power content. And we go round and round on how we should um, rate the cost of energy storage system. I'm starting to lean more towards the kilowatt hour cost. And um, it just seems like to be a better reflection uh, so you can go apples to apples when you're trying to do a project and you're trying to figure out what it costs. It seems like kilowatt hours gives you a better a better feel for what your cost is going to be. Now this is not this is capital cost and not the operating cost. When sometimes you'll see the um, the LCOE life cycle uh, operating cost and um, that's this that's a different number. So uh, one thing for, for the, the engineers in the audience that are not really familiar with energy storage system, this is not the same as the uninterruptible power supply. So the uninterruptible power supply has been around, um, well, for the 40 years that I've been in the business. And basically what that is, and you'll see in the left-hand side, the traditional UPS system uh, down there in the bottom, uh, you, you have a, a AC to DC inverter, you have a battery, you have a DC to AC inverter, and then you have your critical load down below with the, the that's a schematic of a breaker panel. And so the, the power flows straight down, nothing flows back up onto the, the upper distribution panel. And um, at any given time, if there's a power outage, uh, if the battery sees that there's a a loss in voltage, it will supply voltage. The critical load never sees the glitch. Uh, another way of looking at, at that um, system is with a generator installed. So, to, in the say back in the earlier days, it would be all UPS, and then they found that well, we could put a generator, and now um, our battery system would only have to last long enough until the generator comes on. And so that's a schematic of how that would work. And um, that is kind of the early days of what a microgrid looked like. Back when, uh, before they even used the word microgrid, this is what the, the microgrid would, would have been. And with today's uh, terminology and features and with renewables, uh, on, the left, on the left, once again, is another schematic of a traditional UPS system. So you have your power flowing down to the load 
And then uh, on the right now, we have what we call the uh, energy storage system. And I added a couple of the, I added some PV. I just put a box there. I forgot to label it. And the uh, little uh, AC thing there, symbol, that's a generator. And that is a microgrid. Basically, now you have your, your battery, you have some renewables, you have some traditional generation, you have your load, and they all support one another to support the load. So what is battery energy storage? So there, the system is made up of these five components. You have your storage system, which is your battery. You have your uh, battery management system. The battery management system takes care of looking at the battery, it's checking temperature, it's checking uh, state of charge, it's making sure that all the cells in the battery are all equalized at the same voltages. Now, when you think about a cell, um, I'll show you a picture later on, but basically a lithium ion cell, an 18650 cell, basically looks like an oversized double A battery. And so it's, you know, 3.6 volts more or less. So there could be in a big system, there could be millions of these cells. So the, the system is broken up by, um, by modules, by stacks, or by, by modules and I shouldn't say stacks because that will get confused with the flow battery, but you have cells with, within trays, within modules, and, and then you have um, racks of cells, and, and all these cells need to be managed. And the battery management system looks at all those cells, making sure there's no over temperature, making sure that they're all at the same uh, charge level, and, and et cetera. And then that talks to the power can control system, and which, it, which consists of the bi-directional inverter, you know, all the switch gear, transformers, all the interconnection. And um, and then that power control system talks to it, to the energy management system. And I believe I, I don't know that I have a chart here that shows how they all interact, but basically they're all interacting together And the energy management system. Now it controls the charge and discharge It's looking at the grid, wondering what's going on there, getting some feedback, telling the telling the power control system what to do telling the batteries management system what it needs. And now when you get into the site management system, now that's when you get into your microgrid controller. Uh, for instance, there, if you want to manage PV and you want PV to charge, a uh, PV being solar power, if you want that to charge your battery and, and or the grid during operations, certain operations say if the, the grid's on the, the site management system would would allow that to happen and say if the power went off there's a grid outage and you want any excess pv to to go um to your load well you want your pv to feed your load any excess you want to feed the battery to charge it then this site management system is what will allow that to happen and then the last one, last but not least, is your valves of plant. Uh, you need climate control. You need fire protection. Um, you need all the housing, uh, all the bells and whistles, the safety enunciation. That's all going to be in your balance of plant. And all these, all these components add to the cost. So when, when Emery talks about the cell cost, then you have to start adding all these other components in. And all of a sudden now, that's cell cost, the, the cost of your system is two to four times what that cell cost. So let's go into the little, look a little bit closer at the batteries. So you, you got the lithium ion batteries and you know, as Henry Ford said, uh, you could have any, whatever color you want it in a car, as long as it was black. Um, basically, you could have whatever battery you want right now, as long as it's lithium ion. Um, it, it's it's the most prevalent battery out there for stationary energy storage, and as Emery stated, um, the EV the EV industry has really 
help the stationary energy storage industry because the cost of manufacturing has gone down because of the amount of batteries that they're producing for, um, for the EVs. So the advantages of lithium ion battery over other is that it has the higher energy density. I'll show you that in a couple slides. It has a better life cycle. For instance, a lead acid could have the, the traditional lead acid maybe have oh, less than 200 cycles. The new advanced lead acid might be 3,000 cycles, maybe more, and the lithium ion could be greater than 5,000 cycles. And the decreasing cost we just talked about, uh, multiple vendors with, with the lithium ion, based upon all the, you know, all the uh, battery applications for lithium ion, you've got your cell phones, you've got your laptops, uh, you know, look around you, at your desk there, you probably have four or five lithium ion batteries sitting there. Um, they're higher in efficiency, the fast response, uh, the higher efficiency, they could be well over 90% efficient and that includes the power electronics. And basically, traditionally they say the um, lithium ion was good for power applications, power applications being defined as anything less than one hour but that is no longer the case um, lithium ion you could rack them and stack them and basically you can do whatever application you want want whether it's 15 minutes or 15 hours it's just how much square footage do you have and how much money do you have um the lithium ion, the basic chemistry, you got the anode and the cathode. Um, you have a liquid electrolyte between the, between the two. Basically, ions are flowing one way, electrons are flowing the other way. The electrons flow through the circuit, and it's electron flow which provides the current, which makes the light light, the motor run, the computer buzz, etc. So we can talk about some of the chemistries, right? So, so the, a lot of the work that we're doing now is basically how do you, you only have the periodic chart to work with when it comes to a battery. And, you know, like the semiconductor industry had Moore's law, which stated that, you know, every two years, the density of chip or uh, micro or uh, diodes on a chip were going to double and the price was going to half. Well, in the battery world, we have Murphy's Law, and that is whatever can go wrong will go wrong. And every time you try to marry up the, the various elements on the periodic chart, there's always, yeah, but. There's always a but there. So this is, this is where we are now looking at the anodes. Um, biggest potential uh, difference between the anodes and cathodes but they, but they all need to work together and they need to play nice. So you have carbon, you have lithium uh, titanate oxide. Um, and then over on the cathode side, you'll see um, the specific gravity. And these are the various chemistries. You've got lithium cobalt oxide, and um, which you find in your iPhone. Then you have your lithium um, nickel cobalt manganese oxide which you'll find in like the, the LG Chem, the Volt, that's the NMC, and then Tesla uses the NCA, which is the lithium, nickel, cobalt, aluminum oxide. And all these are just variations of lithium ion. And let me get to the slide that, there we go, this is the slide. So there's the energy densities. So you got all the way from the left, you got your, um, Vanadium re redux flow battery at about 40 watt hours per kilogram, all the way up to your NCA, which is the lithium nickel cobalt aluminum oxide, which is 250 watt hours per kilogram. So as you can see, much more energy dense. So you need a lot less of it to build a system of any appreciable size. 
Now, when you hear about the fires with the lithium ion batteries, it's usually going to be the NCA. It also could be the LCO, which is the lithium cobalt oxide. Uh, that's also a high watt hours per kilogram. So the more energy dense, the more energetic the battery, the more chances that bad things can happen. Now, what is going on in the industry now is they're starting to go to more, you'll notice the um, LFP, that's the lithium iron phosphate. Energy density is still pretty good. If you look at the, like over there, look at the lead acid to the left, you'll see the lead acid is less than 50, but the uh, lithium iron phosphate is over 100. So it's almost two, it's two, almost three times as dense, uh, much safer, a little bit more expensive. But um, so that's where we're going. And now uh, um, we're, we're doing some projects now where they're actually taking and they're making hybrids of the various chemistries. So you might have an NCA LFP. Now, don't hold me to that. I don't have the, um, the hybrids in front of me, but, but they're mixing two of the chemistries together to, to serve certain applications. So now they're trying to take the best the one combine it with the best of the other make it safer and uh make it more uh robust for the given application so um one of the technologies that that is kind of holding some promise you'll see basically right in the middle is the zinc manganese oxide and I, I, I apologize for those, those who are not chemists. I'm not a chemist either, and it's taken me a few years to learn all of this uh, nomenclature. But the zinc manganese oxide is basically your Duracell battery. Now, your Duracell battery is not rechargeable, and that has always been the problem. Uh, the very good batteries, but you couldn't recharge them. And with these um, zinc manganese oxide batteries now, um, they're trying to get those to recharge. And with the future is they want to get uh, two electrons, uh, utilize two electrons. So it's basically doubling the current flow. And you'll see there uh, the future and, and that will get it well above 100. And so if that is, um, keep your eye on that because if that happens, that will be a game changer. Dan, I just wanted to uh, let you know you've got about 10 minutes before we need to go to questions. Okay. All right. Thank you, Todd. So um, as I said earlier about the 18650 form lithium ion battery, you can see it there on the right. And uh, you have the green, that's a lithium ion battery sitting next to a, a AA cell. And so... You talk about, um, you know, megawatt systems. Basically, you have modules and modules and modules of these cells in racks and racks and racks. And uh, you'll see on the left, that's basic from the from electric vehicle. And down at the bottom is the traditional kind of looking storage unit uh, with uh, inside there. You will open up and you will see racks of modules full of these green cells. So um, lithium ion summary, the costs are coming down, uh, but we need to do lower, we, we, really, we need to almost half the cost of where we are now. Uh, DOE has some programs out there trying to achieve that through research development and demonstration. Um, we need to work on safety, as Emery said, um, the packaging thermal management, we're working on that because you have to keep the batteries kind of separated from one another. So if what, something bad happens to one, it doesn't cascade to the others. And um, we're, we're, still, we're still working on, and through our demonstration program, we're still working on these projects in application and seeing what we can learn from, from the operation to improve the, the chemistry. So lead acid batteries been around forever. 
Um, they're cheap, they're recyclable, but they don't get a lot of they don't get a lot of um, cycle life, and they're about one fourth, as you saw in the, the earlier bar chart there, they're about one fourth the energy density of a, of a lithium ion. So that means that this for the same amount of power and energy rating, you're going to need three to four times more um, real estate. Now, one one um, right spot with lead acid is it's not going away, and they're doing the advanced lead acid, and basically they're adding a carbon component, in almost uh, a carbon component into the into the cell, and they're uh, building a capacitor in, inside the cell. So the capacitor takes care of all the little per perpetrations you know, little on, off, on, off, on, off. And so that kind of saves the cell from, from, um, from, from overuse. One of the biggest problems with, with a lead acid battery is the dendrite growth. And if you think of a dendrite growth, um, God, I hate to, this, this is my analogy. Uh, I have a, a dryer and it has a lint filter in it. And uh, you get a, piece of lint on the lint filter maybe it's a little wet and it sticks and then you go to empty it out but that stays and then you put it back in the next time it keeps growing that little thing something else sticks to it before you know it you got these globs of lint sticking to your lint filter and so when that happens in in batteries also in all batteries really and then when that happens in in a battery you have these uh, membranes and you have your you have like a um, separators, and so it's very small separation between one and the other, and it with a thin film between the positive and negative. So I don't think I have a good. Let's see if I have a. No, I don't have a good a, a good drawing of it. But basically, you have a plus separator minus separator plus separator minus separator. And as this dendrite growth grows on one of the plates, it will pierce the separator and it will short circuit to the, you know, negative to the positive or vice versa. And the next thing you know, your battery is dead. So the advanced lead acid with a carbon component, it reduces that dendrite growth and allows much longer cycle life. Uh, you'll see here the, the cycle life gets really, really long. But you have to, and the East Pen, which is the green line at the very top, but you have to take that a little bit with the grain of salt because that's a 5% death of discharge. So that's not utilizing very much of the battery. However, however, in comparison to the traditional lead acid, it's much greater. As you can see, um, it was dropping off, you know, less, less than 2,000 cycles with a 10% death of discharge, all the way up to 20,000 cycles with a 5% death of discharge. So we have see, we have these in, in installations and in operation, and the cycle life is much, much greater than the traditional lead acid battery. So sodium metal, the sodium sulfur, the sodium sulfur battery there sitting on the left, it's, it's uh, it's a molten salt battery. It operates at a 300 degrees C. They're traditionally six hours more or less in duration, and that's you can't really you can't get them less than that. So you can't really get them for an hour. You can't get them for an hour. So if you have a long uh, energy app, long duration energy application, these fit. There was a problem a couple years ago with the sodium sulfur for batteries catching fire over in Japan. At that time, they shut them down. They took everything out. They re they fixed, they found out what the problem was. They refurbished all the installations. They reinstalled them and they've been in operation. Um, I'm going to say over, well over a year, if not uh, two to three years. And uh, um, they work just fine. For whatever reason, they really haven't made a, a great inroad into, um, into the U.S. And maybe it's because of the high temperature, 
which means if you're not operating that battery, you need to keep it heated. And that drives your overall efficiency down. And the fact that if you don't need uh, five, six hours of energy storage, then they're overkill. Uh, I won't cover the sodium nickel chloride battery, but they've been around for a while. And once again, they, they you know, anymore because of the cost of lithium ion and the availability of lithium ion, that most people are just kind of bypassing all these other technologies that might serve them just because of uh, cost and convenience and, and um, availability. Uh, there's a nickel metal battery is, is a battery basically that Sandia is working on and, and maybe even p and now I'm not quite sure of that, but they're basically trying to get um, a lower temperature um, rate rating on these batteries and they're using the ceramic ceramic insulators or ceramic separators as as a way of doing that I should have moved on up so so that I don't I don't really have the slide in there that I thought I had in there, but um, we are working on the sodium metal batteries to decrease the operating temperatures. So we go to the flow batteries, a lot of talk about flow batteries, uh, a veteran of flow batteries myself. Um, we have uh, three installations right now. Uh, they do have long cycle life. The electrolyte uh, is, advertised to never really wear out so when you talk about recycling a uh, flow battery after it's after you're done with the project or the stacks go go bad basically you could take the electrolyte sell it back to the battery manufacturer and uh you utilize it in, into another system and actually the business model of the the flow batteries are going to where they're just basically renting the the electrolyte so the owner of the battery system would pay a, a, a monthly fee or whatever is negotiated and at the end of the project or the end of the life of the project they would the um, battery vendor would just take the electrolyte back and um, take it on to this to the next project so um, power and energy decomposition there basically you have your stacks which is the power the energy or tanks of electrolyte, you have both an analyte and a catholyte. And so you could put in bigger tanks and that would give you even more energy um, given the same power of the stacks. The efficiency is much lower as you saw in the chart earlier, uh, like about 40 um, watt hours per kilogram. And the applications of a flow battery, or basically they could do everything that a lithium ion battery can do. Uh, there are some trade-offs when you, when you do that. For instance, if you want to use it for a frequency application where it's going to be on, off, on, off, on, off, uh, the pumps need to be running all the time, more or less. And, and so that decreases your efficiency. Um, there, there are some challenges that we're still working through. It is market ready, but there are some caveats to how you can operate it right now. And actually, Sandia is heavily involved, as well as PNNL, with the vendors of Vanadium Flow Batteries to try to work through these issues. Because we feel uh, through Dr. Uh, Juk's program that we, we have to have more options for, for, the, um, for the industry than just uh, lithium ion. So as I said, uh, with the, the basic chemistry, there, you have your analyte tank, your catholyte tank, you have your stacks sitting there in the middle. The fluid is flowing, there's an ion exchange, and then the electrons are flowing out to your circuit and operating your system. So I think I covered pretty much all this in my conversation. 
Uh, we are working on the next generations of flow batteries. PNNL is, is real heavy into that, and, as well as Sandia. So uh, this slide is um, lithium air. It's kind of almost like uh, pixie dust, but people are still working on it. Zinc air, if they ever can perfect these technologies, they would be game changers. But there's still a lot of um, our hurdles to getting these commercial ready. Um, and as you note, they're looking for operational data to evaluate claims. A lot of people claim to have these systems up and operating, um, but I'd like to see some more data before I would be a believer. So I'm looking at my watch here, so I'm going to have to um, speed it up a bit so we have time for questions. So on the, on the rechargeable alkaline batteries, the zinc manganese oxide at the bottom one there, that's the one that, that seems like it's holding a lot of promise right now. We have a couple projects in the works where we're going to be doing demonstrations up in uh, New York at City College and uh, City University with NYSERDA. A little bit more about the, the zinc manganese oxide. And uh, you'll get all these slides, so you can always look at these. And then if you have questions, you can reach out to CISA. They will get into our hands, or you can ask the questions today. So the battery prices are falling. So you can see from 2013, we were uh, about $600 per kilowatt hour for the sale. Now, um, or I'm sorry, for the sale and the pack. Now we're down to less than 300, so we about half the price. And then um, the the pack and the system were down to about four to four hundred and fifty dollars. And so the pack now is um, that's from two seventy three now to less than two hundred for the pack. But the system, as we as I said earlier, can add two to four x, and and that's where we are with the system cost. However, I I would take this with a grain of salt because you just don't know. For instance, Emery was talking about the cobalt prices. So the gold, cobalt prices, for instance, were at like 40 some dollars per pound, and now it's less than $15 per pound. And that basic that impacts the cost of your cell. So if you really want to know what your energy storage system is going to cost, and you really want to do a project, I would suggest doing an RFI, Request for Information, or request for proposal RFP and go out with what you need, what you want it to do, and get the bids back. And that's going to be the cost of the system. Because um, I've seen lithium ion systems go anywhere from $400 per kilowatt hour to over $1,200 per kilowatt hour, depending on the time of the year, uh, the location, et cetera. That's a little bit more of the same. It's just a little bit of look at how the system adds cost. So there's a lot of there's a lot of money in all the peripherals. And when I, I look at the safety, reliability, and regulatory support. As we're going forward in, in the industry and we're becoming more of a bona fide, um, you know, operation, now we're doing more and more codes and standards. Well, the codes and standards are going to probably add additional cost. Uh, you're going to need cost for your safety features. You're going to need cost for your monitoring. You're going to need cost for for um, separation. You're going to need more footprint. If you know, if they go in and say like a in New York, they said, you know what, we want so many kilowatts in a square footage, and then we want an empty space of so many of so many square foot. Well, basically, 
even though you're energy dense, you just basically have your energy density because now you need all this empty space around your modules. So there's no proliferation of, of a fire cascading um, of fire events. So, so here's a, a, a little, a better little schematic of what I talked about earlier with the five components of the energy storage system. You have your um, your power control center, power control system in the center there. You have your energy management system to the top. You have your site management system at the top. Um, you have your battery management system, and you have your battery. And so that's the interaction between all the battery talks to the BMS, the BMS uh, controls the battery, the BMS is talks to the energy management system, the energy management system controls the BMS, um, power control system is talking to the energy management system, so this big control. Now you say, wow, that's a lot, that's pretty, that's pretty um, complex, and it, it is complex, I would I would ask you to to look at your car anymore and how complex the automobile has become with all the sensors and control management system. So the controls are becoming very ubiquitous, and so this is pretty easy to do, and it, the cost of this is coming down daily. Um, I'm not going to go through the data acquisition system. I, I think I will hold off on that until we do the commissioning and project. And so with that, I'm going to end. And um, I want to thank Dr. Zhuk for supporting supporting me, supporting the programs, and for uh, being an all-around general nice guy. Okay. Thanks very much, Dan. And thank you to Emory. We, as I said at the beginning, we've uh, de we decided to extend this given the number of people we had registered uh, to an uh, hour and a half. So we do have about 20 minutes for questions. Let's start with a, a really basic one. Please define cycle life. So, um, so cycle life. How many cycles you can do with the battery over its lifetime before you have to throw it away? And so cycle life is very dependent on your death of discharge. So um, if you have a very short, a very uh, um, shallow death of discharge. So let's say a lithium ion battery, we'll use that for an example. You charge it between 70 and 90 percent. So it at 70 percent you're going to charge it, at 90 percent you're going to discharge it. So that's a 20 percent cycle. That that life is going to be very very long, as opposed to let's say you're going to go all the way down to 20 percent state of charge, and you're going to go all the way up to 90 percent state of charge. So from 20% to 90%, you're going to be using 70% um, of the battery. So that cycle life is going to be shorter. And so depending on how you use your battery, that cycle is going to determine then your cycle life. So the, 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 the shallower the depth of discharge, the longer the cycle life the deeper the depth of discharge, the shorter the cycle life. Okay. Uh, somebody wants to know what applications, if any, are lead, ba lead acid batteries best equipped to serve in the energy storage universe? So, so they can serve all, they can serve all um, applications, just like any other battery. Especially, especially when you get into the advanced lead acid that has that carbon component, because with that carbon component, now you can do a really lot of, like you could do frequency regulation.
inflammation, which is very shallow discharge cycle. And you can get many, many, many cycles out of that. Now, um, it's still to be determined how that racks up with lithium ion, the same, you know, apples to apple, the same depth of discharge. But, um, and, and then, you know, energy, they, they can do the energy also, but the problem is, is their energy density is much lower, so you're just going to need more of them to do it. Currently, among the favorite uh, applications are backup for server farms and banks, and also telecommunication towers. Okay, thank you. A um, couple of questions here about lithium ion pricing and and anticipated pricing in relation to chemistries and specifically cobalt. Um, question is, uh, it was mentioned that cobalt is used in lithium ion batteries and increasing prices of cobalt may go contrary to price trend predictions for batteries. How and in what proportion is cobalt used in lithium ion batteries and uh, does the uh, price anticipation that Dr. Zhuk mentioned for a possible uptick in pricing account for evolving component chemistries? I suggest Vince answer that one. I agree. Vince, are you with me? us? Yep. Go ahead. Okay, I'm trying to. I got too many mutes on. Um, yeah. So right now they're using, I would say, up to about 20% cobalt in several of these in the nickel manganese cobalt um, materials. There's active research programs that are trying to further reduce that. What we've seen is less stability of the cathode in terms of uh, long-term performance as we take the cobalt out. So there is an element um, that's needed or it's needed in there to to maintain the performance over time. But there are active programs to do it. Um, you know, one of the concerns that comes up with that is um, as we remove the cobalt, we remove the driver for recycling because that's the most heavily element or uh, desired element in terms of recycling is that cobalt due to the prices in there. Um, but again, the cobalt is a small amount of part of the cathode. You've got all the other cost structures with it. So there is fluctuations with the cobalt, but um, you know, by the time you bring on all the other costs, it, it, it creates a small amount. And these arguments are true for any metallic battery uh, except perhaps the most common ones like iron and aluminum. Uh, if it's traded on the stock market, the price is going to go up and down. This is true for lead acid batteries too. Okay, great. Uh, a couple of people in the audience have taken exception uh, to the assertion that there's no U.S. manufacturer of lithium-ion batteries, uh, citing the Gigafactory in Nevada. I assume that the distinction was being made in the presentation between assembly and of batteries versus uh, actual manufacture of individual cells. But perhaps somebody could clarify uh, what was meant by no U.S. manufacturer and and what is being done in in factories like the Nevada factory and what and and where the components are coming from? Vince. Yeah, this is Vince. So yeah, I mean, really, until the Gigafactory came on, um, there was very limited uh, manufacturing. A lot of know-how here. Um, you know, the the rest of the world in terms of lithium ion production. Um, manufacturing still dwarfs what we have in the in the U.S., uh, but that is correct that there there is um, with the Gigafactory now uh, presence and other people are looking at um, you know having that in the U.S. And I understand the actual cells are not produced in the U.S. either. Uh, 
So, so where are they come? Where are the cells? Where is the world's supply of lithium-ion cells produced? Maybe we should. China, Korea, and Japan. Okay. Uh, next question. Somebody says you did not mention saltwater batteries. Would anybody like to address saltwater so, batteries? I'll, I'll take that. So saltwater batteries. There was a company, Aquion, that were were uh, they had the saltwater battery. They have since gone out of business. Um, the saltwater battery. We it, it it had its challenges. It was a very slow. You you could not discharge it very quickly. That uh, we talk about the C rate, um, but you could not discharge it quickly. It was a good battery in the regard. Like if you had a refrigerator and you wanted to run your refrigerator, you could let it run. It would run for a long time but a very low power. And and so it, it just, you know, it just never really caught on. It just, the application was just very difficult. The cost wasn't that cheap, even though it was salt water, you still had to put the salt water in a container and you had to keep that container intact. And you, need, you had the pressure, you had to keep it under pressure. And so, um, yeah, it just it just never really panned out. Uh, I know there's probably still some over in uh, over in Africa. There was some a couple installed in Hawaii. I was actually involved with one installation at Nauha, and we we just took the battery out because I mean it was a nice experiment. It's nice to run a refrigerator, but for the cost, it wasn't worth it. Actually, the Office of Electricity supported the development of Aquion batteries, and it isn't strictly speaking just a saltwater battery. There are all kinds of other ions in there, including lithium. This is Vince. I was just going to add to that uh, train of thought that one of the critical things, and, and uh, it was brought up earlier is understanding how you want to use the storage system and getting a defined use case that you can provide the vendors. That way, if, if you have a battery that charges, you know, uh, very slowly, uh, that would fall out of there and you're not getting a battery system in and then finding out it doesn't have the technical capabilities. And so under the DOE program, uh, the labs have developed uh, multiple, what we call, uh, performance protocols that you can give to a vendor and have them, you know, test to that condition and see which ones are going to work and it provides a good A to B comparison for these different technologies. Yes, and we'll be covering that uh, later on in, our, in the webinar series when we talk about uh, commissioning. Okay. Uh, there are a couple of people who have taken exception to the notion that uh, lithium-ion batteries should have a price goal of $250 per kilowatt hour. Uh, a couple of people claim that Tesla uh, uh, says they are already at $100 or $110 per kilowatt hour, and that GM over a year ago stated they, are, they had their cell uh, level prices down to $145 a kilowatt hour. So what is, is the $250 per kilowatt hour, a, is that a somewhat dated uh, goal or are we talking about something different or are these companies just exaggerating a bit when they give their, uh, their costs? Well, you have a spread of uh, costs for lithium ion and it depends on whether you are talking about a raw cell or whether you're talking about that cell installed inside a battery pack uh, or under what you know where does where does it where does the buck end uh, the cell cost itself is is a lot cheaper and it may may go down to a hundred dollars per kilowatt hours but it's similar to Dan's chart of energy densities which was actually a bit misleading because you should always talk about the density, energy density of a system and not of a cell. And it's similar with the, the costs. 
as you start installing them, uh, it becomes more and more expensive. And and can you really uh, compare an electric vehicle cost um, with stationary energy storage? Now, at the cell level, you should be able to, but at the system level, you wouldn't be able to because I, the electric vehicle is not going to have the AC components that the stationary energy storage is going to have. Okay. I believe the two hundred and fifty, the two hundred fifty dollars per kilowatt hour. That's an AC system. Okay. So um, just, you know, we had several questions about that, and a lot of people pointed to Tesla's claims about uh, being at $100 a kilowatt hour. So it would be an interesting thing to um, uh, clarify or dis disambiguate some of, the, some of these claims and how, how uh, for example, vehicle battery pricing may not be directly comparable to some of the stationary battery pricing or or uh, AC versus DC and et cetera. I don't know if we can do that now, but it's a it's a topic that's obviously caused some confusion and, and should be addressed probably. So, so you know, Todd, I, I do these because I, I want to learn too. So let's take that, let's you and I take that as an action item and, and just make sure what the numbers are, take those questions and let's, let's do a little research on that and see if we can't uh, define it a little better on, so we're apples to apples. Okay. But as as Imra mentioned, I think it is critical for people to realize, you know, oftentimes what's quoted is a sell price. That they this is the price they've achieved at the most basic unit. And once you start putting those in in a module and they're racks of in parallel and series, you know, you've got additional cost into fabricating that uh, and bringing that together. And so what we may be looking at a pack cost, is, and a pack is where we diverge from electric vehicles, um, is always substantially different than, than a single individual cell cost. Okay. Uh, somebody has asked that, uh, to please cover lithium iron phosphate, which I know was uh, covered a bit when you went through the various chemistries. Um, but the person is asking regarding mining safety, reliability, uh, et cetera. How does, uh, how does that chemistry compare with some of the other lithium um, batteries containing carbon or uh, so this is, other, other chemistries? So this is Vance. I can, I can take that one. Um, so lithium iron phosphate has one of the lowest heat generation of all the lithium chemistries. Um, it's shown, at least in small scale tests, to have longer cycle life at depth, deeper depth of discharges than any of the typical ones. The problem becomes, if you looked at that chart that Dan showed where, you know, typical cells 3.8 volts, that's down around 3.4. And so you lose the energy density of it. And so the issue is um, for, you know, EV manufacturers, uh, you have to pack more cells in there and that increases the cost. And so that becomes the primary problem is it's not the first candidate for an electric vehicle. So it is that technology tends to be developed for other applications that don't have the same energy density requirements that aren't growing right now at the same rate. But overall, yeah, I think we would we would like to see more chemistries that were based on the LFP from that stability, the safety factor, and things like that. But they are not achieving, I would say, the similar cost targets that you are uh, of the technologies that are used in electric vehicles. So, so Todd, you mentioned that they wanted to know about the mining. So basically, getting the elements is that what they were wondering? So the question was uh, kind of wide ranging, but yes, um, how does it compare in terms of safety, in terms of, um, you know, the the extraction of, of the component chemicals and, and the related issues there? I, and I, they didn't go into detail, but I'm assuming that 
yeah, you, that would have to do with things like labor and, and environmental concerns. So I don't think they, they reach the penetration that say the NMC does or the cobalt, um, the, lithium, the lithium iron batteries, lithium ion batteries that have cobalt in them. I don't, I don't think the um, lithium iron phosphate reaches the same penetration, but I, have, I do not know of any fires with the lithium iron phosphate. And, uh, and if you look at the, chem, chem, the, the elements, you got lithium, the same, it's going to be for all lithium. Um, and then you have the iron, which is pretty prevalent uh, mineral, and um, phosphate, which is also a pretty prevalent mineral. So I've never been asked that question. And maybe Vince would have better insight on the availability of those minerals, but I'm thinking they're, they're readily available. It, it is a, a readily available. And again, you have none of the uh, sourcing concerns that you have with cobalt uh, uh, in there. Um, it is a little different manufacturing process than you would see for the, the oxide materials, which adds to the cost. So I'd say there's more processing costs, um, less market pool uh, from that technology, but the materials are much more available and, you know, from sources that don't have the same concerns as cobalt does. Okay. Uh, somebody is asking if you can provide some insight on the decommissioning cost of, of utility scale energy storage projects. And this is something that I think is a good question because we don't often think about end of, end of life for technologies and it comes up in everything from, from wind to solar to, you know, automobiles, anything that we create. So what's the decommissioning uh, cost like for for the average, I guess you would say, average lithium ion utility scale storage project. Emery, I know this is near and dear to your heart. You want to take a crack? It's at near that? and dear to my heart, but I have no figures to offer. So this is Vince. I, I I'm trying to remember. Epri had done a report looking at the recycling, and I want to say a lithium ion the decommissioning added about 20%, somewhere in that range, 15 to 20% uh, at the end of life. And basically in several of the people that we've dealt with, if the lithium ion chemistry has a high amount of cobalt, they can get a recycler to take it. They won't pay them for it, but they will take the materials. If it has a low cobalt content, then they end up paying someone to take those cells uh, when they're done. And yeah. So under Emmer's program, there's extensive efforts looking at second use. Can we take these used electric vehicle uh, batteries and actually put those uh, out on the grid and get, because there's still a lot of useful life in there and extend that. And, uh, you know, it's prolonging when we have to pay that disposal cost, but we're getting more out of the system. But yeah, I, I would agree overall. Um, I don't think end of life considerations uh, for lithium ion or a lot of the other technologies are factored in uh, up front enough. And I do see that changing within the last uh, year, year, two years, uh, more people starting to address that. So um, just some anecdotal, I was at the NatBat conference a couple weeks ago and there was a session, multiple presentations on recycling. And I basically walked away thinking, well, there's work being done, there's efforts being made, but there's really no answer yet because we're still new in it. it they're just uncovering. It. There's a lot of, yeah, I think we can, um, but until we start doing, we won't really know. And when we do projects, what we're recommending is when you write the RFP to put in a line item for the, the decommissioning and disposal and to see what they'll charge. And, and then so, so th and then maybe even have them, you know, that's part of their contract. Now the, the, the fear in that is that they won't be around in 20 years when you go to decommissioning the project or nobody who's involved with the project will be around in, 
everybody will forgot that they paid this money to do that. But but at least you can get some idea of what you're looking at to get rid of the battery. Yeah, I should like to remind people again that there is a five million dollar prize by the Department of Energy on recycling uh, technologies. And Argonne National Laboratory is just starting a an initiative on recycling. Okay, very good. Well, we, we've reached the end of our hour and a half here. Um, Samantha, could you put Dan's agenda slide back up? I believe it's maybe the second slide in his deck, maybe the third slide in his deck. Um, I wanted to thank uh, everybody who attended and our presenters, Dr. Zhuk from DOE, Dan Borneo from Sandia, and Vince Sprinkle from PNNL. Uh, I apologize again, we did not get to all the questions. Um, I don't know what we can do. Maybe we can, uh, if you guys are willing, maybe we can try to address some of these questions um, that are left over that haven't been answered or take that as a uh, uh, a task for the next webinar to um, to go back and loop back and get to some of those. In any case, uh, we have future installments in this Storage 101 webinar series that will address applications and economics, policy and regulations, safety and reliability, and project development, commissioning, and deployment. So if you um, enjoyed this webinar, please uh, make sure you, you sign up for these uh, upcoming webinars that are continuing the series, and we'll have the information on um, on dates for those out as soon as they are put on the calendar. Samantha, do you have anything? Uh, I believe we have some other upcoming webinars that might be of interest to folks who are um, interested in storage. We do. So we have several webinars coming up. You can see the details on your screen right now. <clears throat> we have a webinar this Thursday um, and a few webinars in early April, in particular the webinar on April 4th. Todd is moderating that webinar again. Um, that relates to energy storage and the topic is energy storage and state energy efficiency plans, lessons from Massachusetts. So I encourage you to check that webinar out in particular, but do go to our website cisa.org backslash webinars and take a look at all of our webinars that we have coming up. They should all be very interesting and we hope that you can attend them. Thanks, Samantha. And uh, for all the folks that asked, we, we do record these. Uh, you can go back and view them or download the slides from the CISA website. And um, of course, you can contact us if you have questions. So thanks again, everybody, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.